Sorry. Uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome back to the class today. Um, hope you had a good break and you're awake. Um, so we're going to uh, quickly respond to the questions in the chat, and uh, then we will move forward. I've turned the recording on for this lecture. Okay. So we say his question, we responded. Okay. The next question is from Kennedy. Uh, are there things that Jesus did that are not written in the Bible? Yeah, Kennedy. So the answer is yes. And um, uh, this is, of course, stated by John for us in John chapter 20 and also in John chapter 21. Uh, uh, John 20 verses 30 and 31 and John chapter 21 verse 25. John stated that there are things um, um, Jesus did that the, the so many miracles that he did, it's not possible to record all of those miracles. But remember, these are miracles towards the, uh, in his words, in his earthly ministry, not things about his childhood, right? So when you have some people recording things about his childhood, that's just fiction, because the Bible clearly states he started his ministry after being baptized in the River Jordan. And when John says there are many other things Jesus did, he's referring to the healings, miracles during his actual time of ministry, that is after he began his ministry, not as a child. So we can't use John 20 and 21 um, you know, scriptures in John 20 and John 21 to bring up uh, so-called supposed miracles that Jesus did as a child and so on. So we can't use that, okay? Um, let's see, the next question is, Kennedy again, uh, why are the Maccabees writing not recognized and yet the two books uh, contain worthy values? Yeah, so Kennedy, uh, like we were mentioning, in the intertestamental, intertestamental period, which is about 400, 450 years, uh, there were a lot of other writings, so like the book of the Maccabees and uh, a lot of other things that were written. But these were not considered uh, as part of the Hebrew Bible because the Hebrews recognized Malachi as the last prophet. Upon that time. Doesn't mean they were not expecting any others. In fact, they were expecting the prophet Moses spoke about to come. It was not that they were not open, they were open. But for them, first criteria is for something to be considered valid to be included as part of the scriptures, it had to come from a prophet of God. It had to be inspired. And so while a lot of writings did take place, which we refer to as the Apocrypha, or some of them are in referred to as Apocrypha, they are not from a prophet. They are not from somebody who's inspired by God. They are the works of man. So Maccabees and other books that, you know, that form the Apocrypha and other books that were written in the intertestamental period, a lot of literary works happened. They are good, they are virtuous, or they are stories of people, and etc. But they're not from an inspired person. So that's why they're not included in the Hebrew Bible as scriptures, okay? Because that is an important criteria, okay? Uh, next question, Samuel. Is there value in indulging over books such as these, say a book written by Apostle Thomas, may have seen India and thus never got into India. These books confuse or even derail believers. Uh, you know, um, Okay, so th there are people who do read it or read whatever books are there uh, outside of the scriptures, and, and just to turn to try to understand what was happening historically, what was happening. So, you know, the, whether it's the, the lot of others, a lot of other literature during that time, during the early church, and there are people who like to read it because they want to know the history, they want to know what else was happening, going on, and so on. From that perspective, if somebody has the time and the interest, yeah. Uh, but if you're looking for something to grow spiritually, to develop your faith and nurture yourself, then I would say, you know, we let's stay with the 66 books of the Bible. They are meant for our faith and nurturing our faith. But if somebody has the time and, and the interest to read outside, that, that's fine. 
um, it just as a more of information. Some people do that. Some people do read in order to know, you know, what was going on during those times, both during the inter intertestamental period and in the early church, the first 400 years thereafter. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, if people have the time and interest, they're welcome to do it. But if it's about faith, about strengthening your faith, then, I, you know, we stay with the 66 books. Is that okay? Any other questions? Uh, Pastor? Uh, yes, go ahead. Just, this question just came to my mind. Um, what, what do you think was the basis to allow Songs of Songs to enter the, the collection of the Old Testament? Hmm. Of course, I That's understand been... that, yes, it's it's like a figurative um, description of God's love to the church. But I, I'm just wondering, in a way, all the other books, you know, they seem so serious. Then here you come to the Songs of Songs. It's more romantic, you know, and everything about... But what do you think must have been the basis? Why the Hebrew, um, the early Hebrew... Um, I see the community uh, must have chosen that to be part of the holy books. Right. Um, that's interesting. So, uh, I, again, we have to try to get into, you know, uh, we, we, are, we are working back in time, trying to get into the mind of the, the Jewish people at that time. Uh, 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 and I can think of just two reasons. One is that uh, it was... Uh, given, I mean, it, it was Solomon, a man who they knew, uh, inspired, uh, I mean, given wisdom by God. Secondly, it spoke something about human love, which is not something, uh, you know, uh, that God's people are averse to. No, it's part of who we are. It's part of what, part of what God has given to us and uh, 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 you know, made us and and, it, and 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 in the Jewish community, there is a respect for women. There is a respect for uh, uh, there is an honoring of human love, and there is a respect for women. So, uh, I can think of these two reasons: one, because of who was behind it, so Solomon, a man endowed with wisdom from God; second because of the, the respect for both human love and for this human relationship, this dynamic, which is held sacred. Uh, and so, you know, it's not something to be uh, disdained or held, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, be averse to. No, this is, this, this is honorable uh, in, in, for knowing that God designed all of this. So it was uh, still considered as part of the Hebrew Bible. Thank you, Pastor. Welcome. Anybody else? Any other question? Okay, so let's move on. Uh, I'm actually a little behind uh, of what I wanted to do. I was hoping to finish everything in the first hour. <laughs> I think I was a little too ambitious. Anyway, let's try to answer this second question here. Uh, you know, uh, the next question is uh, about English versions of the English Bible, etc. Okay. Now, some of this we dealt with in our uh, course on hermeneutics in our previous semester. Yeah, in our second semester. Uh, so uh, you may recognize some of the things that I'm saying here. That uh, uh, why are there so many? Uh, you know, so the question what we are trying to answer is why? What what is the difference? Why, why are there many English versions of the Bible? So somebody, and we we have to look at it from an apologetics point of view. Somebody may say, hey, you know, you've got, um, uh, you know, you've got so many different uh, versions of your Bible. Which one is correct? And uh, some of it may be even seemingly you know contradictory. Look at you know they can put two or three script uh, versions aside, and uh, the same verse is telling something quite different um, so you know they can they can laugh at us and say well, what's going on here you know which one is the authentic one you know so uh, so therefore they can work backwards and say therefore your 
your original text is corrupt, but that's not the case. Uh, what we do know, like we've already said last class, and I'm not going to uh, go over the details again, is that we have a substantial amount of uh, manuscripts for us to be very confident about the original text. And also uh, uh, in the translation process, uh, people, uh, these scholars, the people who are doing the translation, people who know the Hebrew and the Greek and uh, the, um, uh, the Aramaic that's needed and who are going to work with this, they, they refer to, uh, you know, certain, they've, they've categorized these manuscripts. Uh, one is referred to as the majority text. Um, and, then, uh, and then there is the division of text based on uh, the date and also the region of the world that they come from. So because the texts were found in various parts of the world, right? And so then they choose to which family of texts do they want to use. And so they will work with that and then they will do their translations. And so, you know, uh, some may do a comparison all of this and then they draw. So whichever Bible you buy, the Bible will, in the beginning of the Bible, they will tell you, hey, we have used these texts to translate or we have used a combination of these texts and then uh, we have indicated in the in the you know in the footnote or in the um, uh, margin or in the middle column uh, what uh, what you know what what is found or what is not found in the text that we used etc so uh, you know usually every bible will tell you what set of texts they are translating from but the the, the reason, the philosophy or the reason behind us having so many translations and versions of the English Bible is this, is very basic. So, uh, and this is something we did see last semester, I'm just quickly reviewing. So there are translations that are word for word, right? That means if that word is found in the original text that they're using, they will put, put that, you know, equivalent uh, word or sometimes it may require a few words in English uh, to translate that. So that's called form equivalence, so word for word, King James, New, New American Standard, so on. Then there is a thought for thought. That means uh, we will communicate the original thought into uh, English thought, you know, in, in the same thought in English language. Uh, it's called uh, functional equivalence. Um, now, when they're doing thought for thought, obviously they are doing a little bit of, in, not just translation, but they're also doing a little bit of interpretation for us, right? So they're saying, this is what we think the writer was thinking. And so this is how we should be thinking about it in the English language. So it's not just translation, but there's a little bit of interpretation also coming in, a little bit. It's a thought for thought. Right. Of course, the translators are not trying to fool anybody or translators are genuine people. They are trying to do their best. Okay. Then there is a combination of word for word and thought for thought that is, is referred to as an optimal equivalence. Okay, let's, so somebody said, let's try to find a balance uh, between word for word and thought for thought. And so you have some versions like that. And then there is the essential equivalence, which is meaning for meaning. So we're going away from word for word, thought for thought, and now we're saying meaning for meaning. What we think he meant, we're going to tell you in the English language. So meaning for meaning. And now this usually happens um, when you do, you know, interpreters, when you speak through interpreters. The interpreter is not doing uh, a, a word for word you know, you know, when you're speaking, let's say I'm speaking Hindi and uh, I'm, I'm preaching to a crowd that is uh, that understands Hindi uh, and I'm preaching in Hindi and, you know, somebody is interpreting for me into from English to Hindi. That person is not going to do a word for word. Uh, he's not going to do a thought for thought. Most likely he's going to be working meaning for meaning. He's going to take the meaning of what I said and put that into Hindi language and communicate it to the audience. Now I've had situations where, you know, uh, uh, this, this, this has happened while I was preaching, the interpreter has started telling his own story. <laughs> he has created his own story uh, because he felt he can communicate the meaning of what I'm saying by a story. So the story was nowhere 
in anything that I was saying, right? But he developed her own story and he was using that story to communicate the meaning of what I was saying. So it's like, it's not exactly what I'm saying, but the goal, his goal was, let me communicate the meaning. And so he's developing her own story and he's telling the people. And I didn't understand until long after I said, hey, he's speaking a lot more than when I'm speaking. <laughs> then I realized, oh, this is what he's doing. <laughs> He's, he's made up his own story and through his story, he's getting the meaning across. Anyway, his intent was good. Uh, he was sincere. So, that, you know, that's, that's a big part. So there's a meaning for meaning translation, right? So they're trying to, again, so they're doing an interpretation of it. Okay. Uh, so this is called an essential equivalent. So, so the passion translation, which uh, is getting popular these days, is that, right? And then there's a paraphrase. So paraphrase is... Um, it's uh, it's way beyond thought for thought or meaning for meaning. It's more like okay, let's let's try to tell it to you as a story. Uh, let's uh, put it out to you in a way that you will enjoy reading it. It's it's uh, you know we can't necessarily call it a translation, but it has uh, you know uh, in story form in a sense what was communicated in the text. But some people may at least start reading the paraphrase. So if you want to look at it, you know, in a chart like this, and again, I just got this off the internet, it's not, nothing big here. So if this is uh, on the left-hand side, uh, uh, you're saying, okay, this is closest to the text. Uh, and then you have, you know, as they're moving forward, you're going from word for word, thought for thought, meaning for meaning, and then paraphrase. So you'll find the closest, of course, is the interlinear. That means it's a Bible that has the Hebrew words or the Greek words on top of the each word is the English word. So that's an interlinear Bible. It's of course very difficult to read because it doesn't come out in proper English sentence. It's just exact word for word. But then you'll find, okay, you see in a New American Standard Bible, the Amplified Bible, the uh, English Standard Version, the Revised Standard Version. Then you have the King James and New King James, which are uh, word for word. They kind of come in this category and uh, you know they are pretty close to the original, right? So if you're a Bible study, if you're a person who's studying the Bible, you definitely want to, you know, work with one of these versions of the Bible uh, because they're word for word, they're pretty close. And then you begin to transition into what is thought for thought, right? So you have the HCSB, the Holman, uh, the New Revised, the New American, uh, Jerusalem Bible, the NIV is somewhere here. Uh, a lot of people use the NIV, but yeah, you know, you're somewhere kind of quite away. You thought they've done some interpretation for you already, uh, and uh, then you have the the New Living Translation is kind of here, uh, where it's on the edge of thought for thought, getting ready to move into paraphrase. And then, of course, when you go into the paraphrase you have the good news translation of good news bible contemporary english version living bible message bible so the message bible is like really on the other end of the spectrum but it's close to the audience meaning make it easy for people so if somebody asks the question hey why do you have so many different versions of the bible you explain it like this right like look if i if if i'm speaking to you and let's say you uh, you know russian I know English, uh, I'm going to use an interpreter uh, to help me communicate to you. Uh, the interpreter can do, you know, uh, can, can, can communicate what I'm saying to you in many different ways. Uh, the goal is for you to understand what I'm saying. So the interpreter can do a word for word, every word, he can write it and translate it and tell it to you. Or he can communicate the thought of what I'm saying or he can do a meaning of what I'm saying, or he can paraphrase, summarize, give you a gist of what I'm saying. So the interpreter can do it. The goal is to help you understand and get you to, uh, to help you get the most important things uh, that are being said. And so that is why we have many of these different versions and translations of the Bible, and they all serve you know, a, a purpose. Uh, ultimately, um, we have different kinds of readers. Not all the readers you know, will be able to, of course, you know, handle a King James or a New King James, or uh, uh, some readers may prefer a paraphrase. Uh, some readers, you know, depending on 
how what where they want to start they may prefer something and so the reason we have many different versions is to make the bible more accessible to people now of course in the process there's going to be a lot of difference just like how an interpreter trying to explain something to somebody in russian uh, uh, if he's giving you a gist of what i'm saying that what you read or what you hear in the gist of what i've said will be very different from an interpreter who is trying to communicate meaning for meaning or thought for thought or word for word you know so you might question the gist but that was just a gist or just a paraphrase just a summary of what was being said it will not have all the details it will not have all the specifics but it's the essence of what was communicated so yes things may look very different and also uh, when it's communicated in modern english it may be very different from how it was communicated um, in, uh, you know, uh, let's say a King James version or old English format, and so on. So we explain it that way uh, for to help people understand. Okay, and there's just a list of uh, uh, versions, and so on. Okay, let me just wrap this up. Then we'll take questions, and then uh, if everybody's happy. We will move to the next lesson. Hopefully, we'll get it started. So just to sum up, you know, what we've talked about the Bible, uh, what's amazing is the unity of the scriptures. Um, the unity of the scriptures is not something that is forced but by man, but something that is inspired by God. So although we understand that, um, you know, there was this, a community process in the assimilation of the Old Testament and the New Testament books. Uh, you can't force unity. You know, uh, you can't force that coherence. Uh, it has to be inspired. Uh, the fact is, if it was just a natural human process, the likelihood is it's going to be very divergent. You know, uh, people are going to come up with their own ideas. There's going to be a lot of contradictions, a lot of distortions, a lot of their own thoughts. But because there has been one source and divine inspiration, uh, it is consistent, it's coherent, and it's not forced by man. Man only played the role of collecting it and putting it all together and preserving it over time. But the unity was inspired by God. Second, uh, we also find it's historical and archaeological accuracy. That means uh, you don't find uh, things in the Bible that uh, that uh, you know are um, can be disproven by archaeology or history, secular history. No, it's there. It's valid. Right? Um, then, of course, the scriptures have fulfilled prophecy. Hundreds of prophecies have been fulfilled, which is very amazing because uh, that again cannot be forced. You know, nobody can, nobody's going back and writing something, you know, 3,000 years, 2,000 years ahead. Nobody's doing that. They've just been collecting it. And then over time, you're seeing the prophecies being fulfilled. Uh, so uh, that is another amazing part of the scripture. And some of the things we have mentioned is its, it's uh, indestructibility. Um, many have attempted to destroy it, but it has survived through time. And interestingly, even the Old Testament is pointing to a Messiah. It's pointing to the coming of Jesus Christ. And uh, we also see that the teachings are uh, powerful. And uh, uh, it's, uh, it may not always you know, be what is uh, popular, but yet uh, it's timeless. And it has life transforming power. Lives of millions of people have been changed through the reading of the scriptures. So the scriptures themselves are not just uh, good philosophy or uh, you know uh, good content that you read and you like it, but it's something that changes lives, uh, transforms lives. So it's it's powerful, right? And so uh, um, uh, here's just. Uh, uh, a quote here, I think it's from, this is from uh, the Gideon's Bible that you'll find. Uh, uh, that's really very, very well written here in the last uh, paragraph. Okay. 
So I'm going to pause here. Let's take some questions and then we will move to the next. Uh, okay, let's see now. Okay, there's a question from Christopher. Is thought for thought quite similar to meaning for meaning? The translator is indicating the thought of the author, which in sense translates to meaning. Is there a different process in how these approaches are used? Yeah, um, so the thought for thought, uh, so so let, let, let me put it like this. So in meaning, uh, uh, I am actually doing a little bit more interpretation than in just communicating the thoughts. And I'm doing it for, of course, the benefit of the reader, right? So a thought is, okay, this is what is captured. Meaning also puts in or brings into bear, bear the context and the uh, the relevance to the modern day reader. So what is stated must be understood in the context, but it also must be interpreted interpreted for uh, made relevant for the modern day reader. So meaning uh, it has a lot more interpretive process around the translation as opposed to a thought for thought. Uh, translation. Okay, so a lot more interpretation is being done for the benefit of the modern reader. Okay, okay go ahead, please. Um, Samuel? Uh, thank you, Pastor. Um, Pastor, I don't know if we are going to cover this in this, but the whole process of how the 66 books were put together. Um, you know, um, so just a little bit on that, like meaning, um, was it done by, you know, we'd say like the church and some people did like, but um, like, did it happen over the course of time? Like, you know, was it like a 10 year project or a five year project or was it at like one shot, like they said, um, and, and they put the 66 books together. Uh, so just a little bit around that, um, there's, I've, I've heard a couple of preachers saying that, uh, you know, the 66 books were already being used by the churches, churches in that early period. It's just nobody had taken the time to put them together. But it's not that, you know, somebody sat and filtered and said like, okay, these books fit. But it was like, like the letters of Paul, you know, most churches were already using it. And it's just, uh, they came together and they, it, it, it was like the Bible itself imposing itself on the church. So that there's that part of the argument, which to me changes uh, my perspective a little bit, saying like, you know, it was not people deciding the Bible, what Bible should be, but the Bible itself imposing. So that, that stream of thought. Um, and also if, uh, you know, a little bit more specifics on who put it together um, and how, how long did it, take um, if you know something around that yeah so um, so like what we have said right the, it was uh, and I think part of what you've spoken uh, it, it basically is the answer uh, which is over time uh, you know the 39 books were already recognized as scripture the early church continued with that, you know, uh, as we explained. And then by the time John wrote, AD 90, uh, he wrote the book of Revelation. Uh, we had this, um, the New Testament scriptures, right, the writings of the apostles and so on. We had it. And so when we cross over into the second century, the church already recognized and used uh, the... Old Testament scriptures, 39 books that we have, and the 27 New Testament scriptures. So they were using it right from the beginning of the second century, as we explained. Just that they never called it the Holy Bible, or they didn't put it together the way we have it, right? So, uh, so we, uh, so, so they continued using it. But it was only, like we mentioned, around 
376 AD when uh, around that time 370 when a lot of the different councils of Christian leaders began to officially refer to the New Testament. And of course, the Old Testament is already there, but to officially recognize it and formally say, this is our scriptures. And then Jerome translated the Bible, meaning uh, the scriptures, the Hebrew, uh, the Old and the New Testament. He translated it into Latin for us. So by that time, they had recognized, uh, you know, this is the, scriptures by which we live by. Um, and I think, so it's safe to say that by 370 AD, uh, we had uh, the Bible as we know it. Um, uh, but it was not in one single council that they sat down and said, okay, here we announce, this is the Bible. No, but I think like what you, Walter, what you already stated, uh, it happened over time and these councils towards the end of the uh, third century or the fourth, fourth century, um, they formally recognized what was already accepted by the church by that time. They formally recognized it. So it was more of a formal recognition as opposed to making an official document, you know, uh, by that time. So, and it happened, the interesting thing is it happened simultaneously, more or less simultaneously by different councils uh, around that part of the world, the Mediterranean, who said, okay, these are the scriptures. Uh, we're formally going forward with it. Uh, but it, it had already been followed for about 200, 250 years prior to that in an quote unquote informal way. So, yeah. Charles. As a former, the different versions could the basis for the loss of verses in some versions that are put as footnotes. So Charles, yeah, the answer to your question is um, um, the, the use of the manuscripts and also uh, how the translators uh, would uh, go about doing the translation. Uh, so the translators decide how, uh, you know, okay, we're using these manuscripts and we will translate from here. And uh, if we find something, you know, missing, we will put it as a footnote here. The King James says, we will put everything together. That means whatever we find, we'll put it together. And... Uh, some will say, okay, we, we are using these set of manuscripts. If there's something missing, we will indicate it in a footnote. So that's how they go about it. Okay. When did the versing start from the scroll and does it affect to change the Bible meaning or wording in the Bible? Interesting. Um, the, so Wycliffe did his translation around 1300 something, 13, what's the date there? I forget. I know, somewhere in 1331 or something. Uh, now, I don't, have, I don't know, uh, Kennedy, exactly when the worsening started, but I'm assuming it must have been uh, around that time or maybe even from the time of Jerome, which was around 370, 80. Yeah, I don't know exactly when it started, uh, Kennedy, um, uh, the worsening. Uh, we'll have to find out. Um, and... Uh, does it change the meaning of wording of the Bible? I don't think it would change the meaning. Uh, they were trying to be also keep the flow of thought. So that's why you'll find in, in, in the way it's translated, um, uh, an indication of a start of a paragraph and so on. So even in, in doing the verses, they try to follow the flow of thought. Okay. Uh, I just realized that uh, Mangi was supposed to do a little presentation for us today. Um, uh, sorry, I forgot about it in the very beginning. I just suddenly came to my mind. Is Mangi here on the call today? Oh, Mangi's there. 
Maggie, are you, are you ready to do your presentation for us, Maggie? Um, hello, Maggie. I think he must have given up. So this, um, anyway. Maggie, are you there? Okay, anyway. Hello. Oh, Maggie, uh, do you want to do your presentation? I I completely forgot, and then suddenly it just came back to my mind. Well, right this moment, that you are supposed to you are supposed to do a presentation. If you're ready, you know we'd love to hear from you. Okay, uh, awesome. So I'll, I'll give presentation now. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so, um, to start, I did some some I did some research and uh, yeah, it is start, it's, there are a lot of evidence that supports that supports that uh, Quran cannot be the word of God. Uh, to start with, Quran was only written uh, 150 years after Muhammad was was alive was lived. So that means any of, of the people who wrote Quran, they they never met Muhammad. And some of them were live lived a thousand kilometers away from, from, from where Muhammad lived. And each one of those people wrote his own version of, of Quran. So there are there are around twenty or thirty versions of Quran. That I recognize this Quran, and non, each sect of, of 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 Islam and countries, they choose which one that they, they, they will adopt to use for for their own faith. So that's the first ev evidence. Secondly, there, um, and my my not. If you want to share a screen or something, please feel free to do it. I wrote everything on on, uh, on paper. That's okay. <laughs> okay, so that was the first one. Uh, if we, we compare to the Bible uh, or the New Testament, we say most people, most tested uh, New Testament texts were written by people who either knew Jesus personally, like uh, uh, Matthew or Peter, or people work with apostles like Mark and and Luke. So Quran first of all was only written 150 years after Muhammad is that and although all those people were with Muhammad they most of them died in, in power struggles because they were they wanted to succeed Muhammad. So after a year or two years, they'll be killed so that someone else can take can take their position. So, and there's no evidence that support, supports uh, Muhammad's claim that he he was inspired when he wrote the, he wrote the Quran, because it's only a story that he says is he speaks himself. If we compare to the Bible, where God didn't only give the revelation to one person. The revelation of the Bible was given to over 40 people. Uh, for example, all, uh, the Old Testament was given in a period of more than 1,500 years. And all those, even though it was given to different people, all their topics and all their the writing points to the same message and the uh, same author, compared compared to the to the 
uh, Quran, it's only one person who claimed that he was revealed, uh, the word was revealed to him by God, but he doesn't have uh, evidence to show that God gave him the word. And those who came after him, most of them, they just added their own words to, to what they believed that Muhammad said, because they never met him, and it was words of the mouth they worked with. Thank you, sir. I'll share, I'll share the text uh, in, in, the, in the stream, the evidence. Okay. Good job. Thank you, Mangi, for making uh, uh, the effort to research and share with us. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. All right. One last question, then we'll go for a break. Um, now, why does Kennedy say, Mangi, my son-in-law? I don't understand that. Anyway, uh, Avni, his question is, um, is the ministry of apologetics a particular calling or matter of one's interest, or is it for everyone in ministry to be ready with these answers? How do we understand this? Because we do not see many apologetics around the world. Um, uh, I think uh, it's especially for us who are engaged. So, you know, um, uh, 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 and this is just my opinion. Uh, 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 the you know, um, say especially those of us who are living in urban centers, you know, where people are asking questions, thinking through on many of these things. Uh, we need to be ready to answer, at least provide an answer. May not get into all the technicalities of things, but provide a reasonably acceptable answer on various questions. Uh, uh, you know, if we are out in the village, uh, areas where people are not, you know, they don't necessarily think and ask these kinds of questions. Uh, for them, you know, they just, you know, you pray, you see a miracle, you'll believe, you know, it's okay in, the, in those contexts. Uh, you know, maybe we don't need to be prepared with such answers on these kinds of questions because the audience may not be thinking along those lines. So for them, it's okay. Uh, but for those of us and many of us will be engaged in cities uh, in, in, in a, in a postmodern world where people are thinking on these lines, they're having a lot of thoughts going on, a lot of information coming. They will definitely ask these questions. And so we need to be prepared. And uh, my answer is, uh, you know, I think all of us uh, as believers, you know, whether we are uh, in quote unquote, you know, standing up in front and preaching, but just as believers, we should know uh, for our own benefit and for being able to help other people. Okay. Um, all right. Again, we've uh, run over time. Uh, sorry about that, but let's uh, close in prayer and then we will dismiss. All right. So let me request somebody to close in prayer. Anybody, please jump in and take a moment to say thanks to the Lord. Let's thanks pray. Lord. Okay. Go ahead, Charles. Father God, we are really thankful that you are continuing to teach us. We are called for this, that we are supposed to learn your word and we are able to understand it. And having such teachings, they will help us to understand on how to rightly divide the word of truth. Thank you, Lord, for our pastor. Thank you for all of us that were in this call. Lord, we pray that we'll be able to internalize them, understand them, and be able to apply them for a fruitful living. We thank you. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank Amen. you, everyone, for your patient thank you, listening. Uh, take a quick break. I'll see you in the other class. God bless. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you.